Thank you. I don't have a microphone. I'll use this one up here. Okay. Uh, Buenos dias. We have all been sitting for two hours. Uh, I am a school teacher. I know that you will not hear anything unless I get you to stand up. Stand. Okay. Stretch. Describe. Turn and say hello to your neighbor. Aristides. Uh, okay, and sit down. Oops. It, it, there will be. Oh, there is PowerPoint. Sorry. Just spoiled things. Uh, I won't be using PowerPoint. Um, I appreciated people were taking photographs uh, of the slides, and I said, uh, you'll have to take notes. You, this is a uh, pen, uh, and there's paper in your bag, in the blue bag. So you'll have to take notes or take photographs with me. That's also uh, fine. Um, I'm here to talk about the concept and scope uh, of open access. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about who I am so that you can put this in perspective. Who am I to talk about the concept and scope? Because I am not a librarian. Um, I was the president of a library club in high school. Um, but since then, I've only been a friend of the, the libraries. Um, I'm a professor of education. My job as a school teacher and as a professor has been to excite children about knowledge, learning, ideas, and 20 years ago, 21 years ago, it, as a professor at that point, uh, I discovered that a whole body of ideas was not going to be available to the students that I had taught once they left college or if they didn't even get to college because the universities were not sharing what they had and what they knew and what they had discovered. And so my commitment to open access began in 1998. And I had the pleasure of coming to UNAM, and it's a delight to be back. In 2003, 16 years ago, I came the first time to UNAM to speak about open access. And the three that came to my presentation, I'm still very grateful to each of them. It was a very small turnout at that time. Um, but it is an idea that has taken hold, and I want to talk about that. So when I talk about the scope of open access, what began at UNAM with maybe five, let's be generous, five people in the economics department at UNAM, which I have no idea where that is, um, it has grown. And I want to talk about the consensus that has been reached very conveniently uh, set here with all of the major publishers, nicely arrayed. I will have some positive and maybe not such positive things. Uh, Sabrina had a few criticisms in store there for Elsevier at least. Um, so what I want to consider then is the scope and the concept of open access. And I want to consider as it has changed. So let me start. Actually, it's the concept and the scope in our title. Let me start with the concept. The concept of open access that we need to carry forward is one of universal open access. There is no other concern that we need. Whether it is machine readable, whether you can data mine it, no. Ask yourself, no. Demand, expect universal open access. Because without universal open access, with a partial form of open access, what we are learning is that we have extremely limited open access. And I will give you some examples of that. But let me just talk about what I mean by universal open access. By universal open access, I mean the entire body of the work that we do. Even if people have a right to this knowledge that the university produces, that public institutions like this one, and the private institution that I work at that is tax-exempt 
because it is in the public service, either the public has a right, and every researcher in the world has a right to that knowledge, or they don't. We don't talk about they have a right to 30% of the literature. We don't talk about they have a right to literature back to 1996. They either have that right, and you, working in libraries and universities, have to expect that is the standard. And anything less than that is something that needs an explanation, that needs a transition plan, that needs to be something we will overcome. It has to be universal. Now, the advantage of saying it's going to be universal, and I haven't said this in previous years, is that we have the agreement of all of these parties. We have, for the first time, a consensus among granting bodies, among academics, very reluctantly, in some cases, among societies and publishers and librarians, that open access is better than closed access. That open access is better for science, research, and scholarship than closed subscriptions for those who can afford it. And we only got that consensus in the last few years. In 2017, Elsevier had five what they called surprising facts. I, I, I'm charmed that they knew this was going to be surprising. And the first surprising fact that Elsevier announced in 2017 is Elsevier is an open access publisher. <laughs> exactly. Don't look surprised. That was 2017. So yesterday. It claimed to be with 46,000 open access articles. No, 26,000 open access articles. It claimed to be the second largest open access publisher. Now what surprised me was that that was the last straw in gaining a consensus. Everyone agrees open access is a better way to do what we do. And we now have this question of how do we get there. So two things we have, all right? One is what kind of open access do we want? Universal. And the second is, how do we know we can get it? Because there's a consensus that it is the right thing to do. And we didn't have that in 2015. In 2012, Elsevier was backing legislation in the US government to close down the public access policy of the NIH. Am I sounding a little dry? <laughs> Sorry. So, let me give you the scope in, in terms of where we are today. The one thing I want to start with is where we are in Latin America. If there is any home for universal open access, if there's any region of the world that understands the meaning of universal open access, it is Latin America. The studies we've done have pointed to the 90% level. Juan Pablo Alperin, whose map was shown here, found that in Latin America, 25% of the people looking at research articles. Oh, is there a call for some time? 25% of the research articles downloaded in Latin America are downloaded by non university people, otherwise known as the public. And that's what universal access does. It means that people expect to be able to read what the universities produce. And so what I want to talk about is Latin America's example and Latin America's role in terms of how we can achieve universal open access on a global basis. Thank you. Where we stand generally, and there's always questions about this, is roughly at 30% of the literature. 90%, 85 to 90% of Latin America 
30% globally of the literature is open access. 70% of research remains behind paywalls. So we have a long way to go to universal open access. And I want to give you a sense of where things are on a global basis. I've introduced Latin America, so Rita introduced very well the situation in terms of, of different initiatives, in terms of the work of her doctoral students, the way in which Latin America is bringing down hierarchies. That's such a, we should have like placards. Bring down hierarchies to me seems like a very powerful aspect in multiple dimensions, everything from impact factor to the global distribution of knowledge. But where we are is in a patchwork. The problem and one of the reasons I think we have to focus on universal open access is we have a patchwork of access. We have delayed open access. 80,000 articles that are sponsored by the National Institutes of Health in the United States have a 12-month embargo, up to 12-month embargo. We did a study with doctors. We gave doctors in the United States free access for a year. And two-thirds of those doctors did not look at any research. I'm not going to any of those doctors. One-third of the doctors did look at the research. About once a week was the average in terms of one article. And the doctors who did look, 50% of the articles they looked at were new. And in the United States, new biomedical articles can be embargoed up to 12 months. So we have delayed. We have the final draft, which, the, again, the US government and many funding agencies require that the final draft be de deposited. These are not universal open access conditions. These are compromises with a print air subscription system. <coughs> We need something that does not place these restrictions. If you have a right to the knowledge, what's with the 12 months delay? Why can't you see the original? You have the right to vote. Canada just, I'm a Canadian, by the way, working in the United States. I'm trying to colonize this big country to the south of us and reverse action that they haven't recognized. It's not a stealth colonizer of the United States. Canada just had an election. Canadians had a reasonably high turnout because they have the right to vote. But if any of those Canadians had been told they have to wait 12 months to vote, they wouldn't consider it a right. Or if they had to hand write their ballot, they wouldn't consider it a right. So we need to think about this access as a right. It's also, I should add, a tradition. At least pointed out earlier that this is a, a tradition going back centuries. I would take it back to the monasteries, where all of the books were a shared property. And the idea of the library is representing itself a shelter or a refuge of universal access. Everyone who walks into that library has equal access, whether they're a student on their first week or a professor reaching my age, they have equal immediate shared access to what's on the shelf or they can recall the works from people who have it. So we need to think about how we can achieve that and right now the 30% is inadequate. So what's happening? Well, the APCs, the article processing charges, have shown that it's economically viable. The APCs, let me give them credit for one minute, we would not have Elsevier with its surprising facts if it wasn't for APCs. We wouldn't have the top journal in biology, the highest ranked journal, PLOS Biology, if it wasn't for APCs. But APCs started in the biomedical field and let them have it. It doesn't work. It is not scalable. It is the opposite of universal. And you know what? Plus, the Public Library of Science is tired of APCs. They've had enough of the inequity, enough of chasing down the money, and they are interested in an alternative. And I want to propose two to you today, but let me continue. Another big development among Elsevier, Wiley, and Springer Nature 
is the read and publish, or publish and read, transformational agreements. Because of those agreements, Dutch authors will now be more open access, will have more open access articles than anyone else. Because they signed an agreement that allows Dutch authors to be open. Well, we're done here. I mean, as long as Dutch authors are open, that's universal open access. We're like this. No. Germany has signed this agreement. Okay, we've got Dutch and German authors. Sweden has signed this agreement. Great. Now we have like, no, we have Dutch, Swedish, and German authors. Is this a quick, expeditious path to open access that is universal? No. Worse than that, it introduces a new price structure. It introduces levels of negotiation, the likes of which we haven't seen. And what it does for those countries that are not participating is saying you have no additional access as a result of this except to the authors from our country whose citation records will go up on and on. Let's bring down the hierarchies, remember that? <laughs> so we have other systems for open access. OJS, Open Journal Systems, is one of those. The work I do with the Public Knowledge Project, that was introduced by Antonio, has been to develop a platform that Latin America has been the largest champion of. There are 2,840 journals, independent journals, sponsored by independent scholar-run journals, sponsored by the universities of their respective countries that are using this free open source platform. And so open access has a whole body in the area of 20, 15 to 20,000 journals, that's probably too high, maybe 10 to 15,000 journals that are independent, that are not recognized as gold or diamond or whatever, but that are demonstrating ways in which universal open access can be achieved. But we still have this mix, and we still need to begin to think on a universal scale. We still need to ask ourselves the Kantian preposition or proposition, excuse me, proposition that what we choose for open access has to be applicable everywhere, has to have benefits for everyone, has to be in a way that does not exclude any readers or any scholars from participating. And Publish and Read and APCs do that. We have Elsevier's recent <coughs> breakdown in negotiations. This is a very interesting phenomenon. And this has to do with Sci-Hub, are we familiar with Sci-Hub? 80% of the literature is freely available. People are using it, but no one is canceling, no evidence at least we have, that anyone's canceling subscriptions. Everyone knows that Sci-Hub is not the future. Everyone knows we can't depend on Sci-Hub because Sci-Hub depends on publishing. But it has changed the game. And California, the University of California system said no to Elsevier over its new pricing structure that it tried to introduce with read and publish, or publish and read. Germany has said no to Elsevier. And Holland, I believe, I might be wrong about that. So people are saying no to the publishers these days, and this is changing things. And Elsevier has made, excuse me, Sci-Hub has made that contribution, has changed the concept of what can be done has exposed the artifice of delayed open access, of APC prices that exceed $3,000, have exposed the process in which we've lost sight of the control of our work, and in which we can't seem to manage to exercise this right to the, this knowledge. Let me introduce one more, the funders. The funders have turned a corner. Coalition S is a very good example of funders devoted or dedicated to promoting open access and open science, open data related aspects. What we're going to see and what we're beginning to explore, and I want to begin to shift into the future, three aspects of the future. Let me do that. Let me introduce three aspects of the future. That was the current state. One of those is a funder payment to publishers. 
that if an article is sponsored by a funding agency, shouldn't that funding agency pay for its publication costs? In whose interest is it to have that information made public? It's in the funder's interest. And so we're going to have a new level of expectation. We're going to begin to track in Latin America and the rest of the world what articles have a sponsor. And we're going to begin to invoice the funders. We're going to begin to ask the funders to pay their share of publication costs. Not through the researchers, no disrespect to the researchers, but they're not the best consumers. They're not very price conscious. The money is unequally distributed. And they're not really good with budgets, let's face it. So what we want is for the funders to pay for each article a reasonable publishing cost. And we've been working with them, and they have been a little bit reluctant, but Coalition S said that in 2024, it's always good when you put things way out there, people will forget. And everyone here is a witness. Coalition S said in 2024 it will begin to pay publishers directly for the costs of publishing work that the members of Coalition S, the funders in Coalition, have sponsored. Let me give you two more. One basic and one more radical. Two more ways of going forward. The basic one we're working on is called Subscribe to Open. It involves the libraries. If you are already subscribing to a journal, what if we say to you, for the same price that you paid last year, we will make that journal open? Do the math. How much more will it cost the library? None. Maybe 3% for inflation, 2% for whatever. How much money will the journal lose? It's getting the same it got last year. And subscribe to open means the library is subscribing to this idea. The library believes the openness of the journal will be a benefit to its community, not just in the university, but in the larger community. We have two pilots going on right now. Berghahn Books and Annual Reviews. Annual Reviews has five journals. It's saying to publishers, saying to libraries, this year, if you pay, actually 5% less than annual reviews, it will be open. If you do not pay, it will stay subscription closed. Get it? The library gets no advantage except to make it open. The publisher has a fallback. Bergon has 13 anthropology journals it's offering. Only to subscribers. If you didn't subscribe to the journal before, no one's asking you. But Burkhan, I just got an email yesterday from Vivian Burkhan, it's a family business. And she was saying she's getting new subscriptions. People who didn't subscribe to her journal when it was closed are now subscribing to it when it's open. We weren't expecting that. It's a, because they're subscribing to the idea. Let me jump to the last idea. My final minutes. This is a much more radical one. This is me colonizing the United States. <laughs> I've decided, very quickly I have to present this to you, I've decided that in the United States the copyright law is unconstitutional. The copyright law today violates the United States Constitution. Now is that just like a Canadian? No, actually it's not. <laughs> We're very timid people. You would say, thank you for letting me in. But I'm not that way. I'm saying, hey, wait a second, you had me come in here to teach your kids at Stanford, and you want me to work under a regime that is unconstitutional and it's copyright law? Why is it unconstitutional? Because copyright law in the United States has a constitutional clause. No other country that I know of does, certainly Canada doesn't. The constitutional clause says we can only pass laws of copyright to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. To promote the progress of science today, you put it, a subscription price on it in the thousands of dollars, or you charge an author $3,000 a pub. No, no. That does not promote the progress of science. 
Open access promotes the progress of science, and copyright law does nothing. For open access, it does everything for subscription exclusive access by those who pay. The law has fallen into a state of unconstitutionality, a violation. And I'm going to use Taylor Swift to win this case <laughs> because Taylor Swift got very upset about the law and felt that copyright was not protecting Taylor Swift. She felt the law had let Taylor Swift down. And I was down with her on that because the law said nothing about streaming. Nothing about Spotify. And last year, the law changed. They didn't call it the Taylor Swift Act. <laughs> they called it the Music Modernization Act. And in it, just very briefly, and in it they did two things that I want to do with scholarship. One, they have a compulsory license. Anyone can stream Taylor Swift if they pay a fair price. You don't have to be Spotify. Taylor cannot say, you can't stream me, as she did say before. It's a compulsory license. Anyone can get it. We want a compulsory license for research that says it has to be open access. The second thing it does is it provides fair compensation for Taylor. In this case, my friend's behind me here. <laughs> They need a fair compensation. And how Taylor gets her fair compensation, not one, not two, but three judges, a tribunal of judges, set the price for each download of her song. And both the pub, both her publisher, Taylor, let's imagine Taylor, Taylor coming in, Spotify coming in, or whatever service you do use, and they agree on a price that will stay for years until so someone has some changed circumstance. So think about it. If our of the research, we're going to start in the United States, but I'm coming to Mexico next, and then to Brazil. If the law says that research and scholarship is different than the music of Taylor Swift, and needs to be treated differently, and requires a special license that is compulsory, because it's in the public interest, and because the current law is not working, that the current law after 20 years can't do better than 30%, that the current law does not allow us to follow Latin America's lead. And so we have two conditions. One is there's a compulsory license for immediate open access of every publication and a guarantee of fair compensation for publishing costs where the librarians get to speak as willing buyers, they call them willing buyers, and Elsevier gets to speak as a willing seller. No monopoly, no arbitrary price increases, but a tribunal of how many judges? Three. Good, you're a good class. <laughs> so we have the present state, we have an expectation that we're going to carry forward we have a new standard for asking ourselves, is this what we want? Universal open access is what we want. And we have two, practic one practical and one a little bit crazy idea. Thank you very much.